Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Today's guest is Calgary Ward 9 candidate, Damon Can. Damon, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, thanks for having me, Chris. Damon, uh, I, I start off all my interviews the same way. You're no exception. Where's your sense of duty come from? Uh, I, think I appreciate that you start with that. That's, that's a good way to go. Um, so for myself, um, the short of it is I would say I get it from my mom and my upbringing. So uh, I actually, I uh, was born and raised in Northeast Edmonton. So, you know, that small town north of here. Yeah. Um, but uh, actually the specific place where I was born means something to me, especially as I'm running in Ward 9, uh, because it's um, the, where I grew up, it was a good mix of, you know, a lot of working class families and new Canadians searching for new opportunities. So it was a really diverse mix um, that I grew up around. And that was the kind of place that, uh, that I was comfortable in in my formative years. And, uh, and then when we look at uh, East Calgary, you see that too. You see a mix of people, different income levels, different backgrounds and all that. So it's something that connects with me. Um, but uh, my, uh, so my dad's family is uh, English, about three generations in Alberta. And then my mom's family, they came from Guyana in the 1970s. So she was about five when she came. Um, so, and then uh, our ethnicity on my mom's side is uh, Indian, so South Asian. And, um, and just from that experience, I guess, coming from a family, I grew up, I guess, really closer to my mom's side, because my mom, and my dad split pretty early on, and he was in and out until about my late teens, when we got to oops, develop a, a good relationship there. Um, and, uh, but yeah, growing up, uh, my mom did an amazing job of making sure that my sister and I never went without and, you know, growing up in a single parent household can be challenging, but I got to, you know, acknowledge my mom's an incredible woman. And what she really did was focus on making sure that we do well in school and making sure that we are, we grow up with strong family values and a commitment to do the best that we can in whatever we do. And I think that's the foundation of my, of, uh, of kind of my servant approach, doing my best, this sense of duty is that, that that's what she said. She gave us the freedom to choose, you know, wherever you feel passionate uh just do your best in whatever you do and i guess that's the source there was your mother or father because I, I, from my research i know that your father has passed away and from what mm -hmm. you said there uh were they political or are you sort of the odd man out in the family to go the political route uh, a little bit uh <laughs> yeah my, my mom and dad weren't very political um but funny enough actually my grandma she she got involved and because yeah she came from guyana and and she, like a lot of, yeah, new Canadians were passionate or excited about the opportunity. So yeah, she was involved in politics and actually we had a phone call a couple of weeks ago, which was really nice where she gave me all the insights and all the strategies. So uh, it was really nice uh, getting to hear from her experience. And then she worked across parties at the provincial level, federal level, just volunteering. Um, but uh, so a little bit of history there. Yeah. So why now? Um, you, you, you come, your resume is amazing it's it is one of the most magnificent resumes that like just looking at your background your nonprofit sector work your uh, work in the schools uh with uh, the policy uh, school you seem like this would be something that you'd be doing 10 15 years from now but you're doing it now so why now why in 2021 is damon running for ward 9 city council Thank you. Yeah, that's it's funny you'd say that. I would have said the same thing, uh, let's say about a year and a half ago. Uh, yeah, it wasn't my plan to jump into politics. Uh, I, I enjoy, I made a career in public policy. And as you mentioned, I've, I've worked for the government of Alberta. I have an undergraduate in political science economics. Uh, I gr graduated from the School of Public Policy here in Calgary um, with a master's there and have been working in the nonprofit sector. So yeah, I was comfortable with my trajectory, you know, kind of uh, getting that experience being in government and then in the academic space and then also in the um, uh, working the nonprofit sector here in Calgary. So I, I enjoyed that experience and, and seeing it from different perspectives but then I kind of in a sense I just felt a little bit of a, a maybe a nudge something there. It was about a year ago because I really I really sat on it and I took the time because the number one reason why I'm running is to serve uh, my neighbors, serve my community and, and I saw the opportunity to do that in a new way and uh, that specifically comes from watching what was happening at the city level and just seeing that there's I think the unfortunate uh, the division the arguments and all that piece I think has created about a lot of noise that's taken us away from the basics of listening to communities and then finding solutions together 
So I think that's what motivated me and seeing the opportunity that I can bring my experience and uh, and serve my computer my community in that way. And and a, a interesting thing for me, even as a public policy professional, someone that pursues this and is a student of it, uh, is that I get to now approach it from a new light, which is you know public policy doesn't happen without the public. So now it's what do the people want, and how do we make this happen? And I'm really excited about that opportunity to you know affect change in that way. Well, it, it, change is one thing that you hear a lot of politicians talk about. Mm -hmm. It is a common theme when you're looking at federal elections, provincial elections, even municipal elections. So I, I asked this question and only because you mentioned change. What has changed to you? What is the dramatic change that you would like to see at City Hall that would better help the residents of Calgary? Yeah, that's a, and that's good because we get to the basics. You know, what do we want to see happen? And for me, what I would like to see and this is a concern actually from door knocking is I've heard a lot of Calgarians that say that they participate in engagement, but they don't feel like they're listened to, that they, they it's a checkbox exercise and that they, um, the answer was already determined. So the change that I want to see is that people are empowered and engaged and they are put in a position to share input and then affect change and that it's a clear process. So I think that's what's really important to me though, as we bring forward, because I, I appreciate the great work of the city of uh, Calgary staff, the administration. I've got, I had the opportunity to work with them and connect with them. There's some really talented people there. And I think it's just um, doing what we can to communicate a structure and a plan. So this is a policy decision. This is something that's happening in your community. Here are the timelines. This is where, when you get to share, we're gonna give you the information you need. And then that way people are really engaged in the process. And then, and then you let them know this is when the decision is made because we can't just talk forever. Uh, so, uh, so this is the timeline so that you can be engaged, contribute, and then feel like you're, well, know that you are a part of that decision-making process. I, I, I'm relatively new to Calgary. I've been here for two and a half years and I, I've spoken to my neighbors socially distanced as, as everyone is doing right now. But yeah. um, the one thing that I hear is there's a disconnect between Calgary City Hall and the Calgary residents. And you mentioned it a little bit uh, in your last statement there. I want to know in, in Ward 9, how do you better communicate to the residents what's happening at City Hall? Because we we're both I'm I'm from Ward 10, so just north of Ward 9. Yeah. Um, we have a very diverse group of people. Not everyone's spoken language is English. Yeah. But you see the most communications that's coming out from City Hall. English. How mm -hmm. do you change the attitude to say not everyone can speak one language? We need to change up how we're communicating to our residents. Yeah, I, and you know, I I've seen, I felt it in, in that we went door knocking, and, and in certain areas, we I ran into that specific issue. You know, I knock on the door. There's a language barrier, and yeah, I can't connect like uh, like I was hoping to, and really get their input. So. Uh, I think that's an important thing to raise and definitely something I've seen. What I would emphasize in that part, and this you know, taps back into my work in the nonprofit sector, is working with the community groups, like the different groups. Because then even in, my, uh, in the experience of my family, um, there was a Friends of Guyana group uh, back in Edmonton. And, and there's different cultural groups like that that really help new Canadians uh, and is, is a lifeline in a lot of ways. I know, um, you know on, the one, on the more dramatic side of things, it really makes a huge difference when you have these groups that can help people in a tough position, uh, but just even generally. So I think the, uh, the avenue to really engage those groups is to, is to connect with the community organizations um, that are a part of their community and that they have relationships with. And that's something that I learned, you know, working in the nonprofit sector is that it's so much to do about relationships. And uh, I know even when I, uh, I was working in the government of Alberta around disability supports, I got to work in the area of FASD, so fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And an uh, incredible thing they did there was they, ha they started these uh, community organizations that led the strategy. So the provincial government just provided uh, guidance and resources, but then they had uh, community groups across the province that then led, because then they formed the relationships and that made the difference. And that's something that really struck me and, and has, only, has only been sorry, emphasized as I've worked in the nonprofit sector here in Calgary is that these community organizations have these relationships. So as government, it's really important that we work with these groups to connect and, and get over those barriers, right? 
How do you see your position if you are the successful candidate on October 19th, 18th? Sorry, I want to make sure people vote on the 18th, not the 19th. Um, but how do you see yourself? How does your past benefit the people of Ward 9 to be a better candidate, be a better counselor uh, going forward in the next five years? Because in the next five years, we have the city of Calgary has to recover from a lot of hardships. We have to recover from uh, COVID-19. We have to recover from uh, the global economic downturn of oil prices. So how does your background in policy in nonprofit organizations benefit the people of Ward 9? Yeah, I think I'll answer that in two parts. I think the first part, the um, I would emphasize my, my time at the School of Public Policy here in Calgary. So I got to, I completed the program there, did a master's there, and I got uh, awarded two research internships, which was great because I got to see the academic side of things. And just from that experience, I really saw in the field of academia, it's going for expertise, basing everything off of evidence and, it, and just maintaining that high standard of using data and evidence. So I think that's what one aspect that I will bring uh, to the table is that understanding the role of data and evidence, applying that, and the thing that I really commend the school for doing was uh, emphasizing on putting policy into practice. And that was one of the reasons I chose it because you can do all the research, all the, write all the reports and articles, but if you're not able to apply it to practice, then you don't see changes in people's lives, which is the ultimate goal. So I, I appreciate what they taught us there and what I've taken away, which is applying that evidence and applying it to, uh, to people. And then on uh, my second kind of approach to that, what else I bring is that, um, I guess speaking to my personal experience. Um, so as you mentioned, my, my dad passed away and he had a, a, a condition that was degenerative. Well, it got yeah. worse over time. Um, but uh, so that was, uh, that. so over time his condition got worse. And in the last few years of his life, he, uh, he was living with a disability and, and various disabilities. So. That from that experience, I saw firsthand what people in the healthcare system can do in terms of what it mean, meant for myself and my family was to have them there to, while we go through what was an emotional, very challenging time, was to have their support to help us through and to take care of him. Um, so I saw that firsthand and that helped me shift my career in that time because I, I knew politics, public policy. After that, I knew, okay, I need to help people in need because I've, I've benefited from the amazing people that do this work. So I want to do my part using my talents to make a difference there. So I guess I would bring that personal experience and then what I've done since, which that experience brought me, I, I did a, a suicide assist training to learn how to speak to people in that situation. And then from that, I volunteered at uh, the distress line in Edmonton. So I got to actually speak to people in, you know, in their darkest hour and their toughest times. And the focus was to then help people to give hope, but then also to connect connect to community resources. So I guess from that experience, which I found incredibly valuable and it was important to me to then be working in public policy to have had that hands-on experience. Um, so I guess those are the two points, the evidence piece and then the personal know knowing how to help people in need. You talked about door knocking, you talked about mm -hmm. the language barrier, but I wanna talk about specific issues. What are you hearing at the door? What are you actually hearing from residents of Ward 9 saying this needs to be addressed? Because um, everyone is going to have their own top three ideas of what needs to be addressed at City Hall. And as a counselor, you will have to uh, identify the top priorities of the ward and also the city. So what are you hearing from the residents that you're speaking to about the issues that are facing them today? Yeah, and that's that's an excellent point. The the approach that we're taking to this campaign is to one connect with people, hear what the issues are, and then do our part to try to find solutions and partners. That's the one two that we're doing. Uh, so that's exactly our first step in what we've been doing over the last few months, uh, door knocking, and uh, and then we've highlighted in the priorities that came out of it. But number one, and I guess I'll, I'll pause before I get into it. That it is really interesting as you door knock in different communities, as you start to learn the character of each one, right? The unique features, because in, in uh, Ward 9, we have a range of communities, right? We have the Renfrews, the Bridgeline, Englewood, Ramseys, which are very unique. And then we go out uh, east. So I live in Albert Park, Radisson Heights, and then Forest Lawn, uh, Applewood Park, all the way out to Belvedere, where we have new communities coming up. And then in the south, Ogden, and then Manchester, and then all the industrial commercial places in between. Uh, so yeah, it's a lot of fun trying to 
uh, get a feel for that. But the point there is that there's unique features in each. Um, what are, like you said, the role of the counselor is to try to find what's most important, what's impacting the most uh, amount of residents, uh, people that live in Ward 9. So what we've heard, uh, number one is safety. So as we know, coming through the pandemic, even before, unfortunately, there's a lot of people struggling with homelessness, addiction, and, uh, and low-level crime is essentially the result, right? And then as we talk about the pandemic and how it's impacted people, we've heard about that K-shaped recovery, right? For some people, it, it, it hit us all, but then we've been able to, you know, wait it out. And some even have done okay saving money and things like that. Others, it's been a tough time and it hasn't gotten much better, which is really important that we need to keep in mind. Uh, but that is one of the factors that's contributed to seeing more people struggling. And then when they're struggling, they end up in those circumstances where you see, you know, theft and disturbance and things like that. So that was the number one uh, that came through. And it was a little more prevalent in some areas opposed to others, but came across. And, um, and then the second point that came across was uh, helping essentially the economy. So uh, building a prosperous communities. So helping those local communities to recover because we know they've had a tough time. And, uh, and then that really connects into the job market because we know uh, that impacts everyone and it's been a really tough time, not to mention 2015, <laughs> since 2015, Calgary's had a tough time. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then the final point is bringing communities together so that's the feeling. One of the things we specifically heard and we kind of touched on it is that people feel the engagement isn't, isn't, uh, isn't doing what they like, their voice isn't being heard and that's a concern, but then also uh, doing what we can to engage people and then bring communities together. So we've seen a great deal of division come forward and, uh, and it's not, the politicians can play a role in helping to counter that and try to build people together, treat people respectfully and, uh, and then find solutions together. So, um, yeah, those are essentially the three things that have really uh, stood out so far. I, I want to touch briefly on all three topics there, because uh, mm -hmm. one of the things that I noticed when I first moved to Calgary was the, the narrative in the media of the Northeast. And I, I say Northeast, but I will include Cal, uh, Ward 9 as well, because you are the mm -hmm. Eastern part and you are the Southern tip of the North East, let's say. Um, the narrative of the media is, crime, drugs, uh, the officer that passed away uh, by a senseless act of violence was in the Northeast as well. Um, how do we bring community groups together to work to solve this issue? You, you, your past, your experience has mm -hmm. to have a way to do that. So on day one of your job, what is the first thing that you're doing to ensure that these community groups, uh, the Calgary Police Services, are working together for the safety of all residents? Because some residents will say, I don't feel safe because I might be uh, Black. Uh, others might be, say, I don't feel safe because I'm transgendered. How do you bring these groups together to ensure that everyone feels safe in their home and in their community? Yeah, um, I guess number one, even before my first day, my goal is really to connect with groups um, across Ward 9 specifically, and then, you know, we can partner out broad, more broadly. Um, but yeah, it's, I guess, as we state too, as we talk about this, and what we want to do is work with uh, Calgary Police Service, CPS, and then community groups and uh, members of the community. Uh, so I think the first step is then connecting with those community groups, because we see it there are many groups that have already organized. And, and a, a wonderful thing that you see when you actually are door knocking and, and going into some of these places that they would say tougher areas um, is there's people that, yeah, I've been here for 20 years. Like it's not, I'm not afraid. Like it's not that uh, they're afraid and they're running away. There's people invested in these communities and they want to see them do better. Uh, so it's our part just to connect the pieces and then build those relationships with them because the people live there, they can, um, they can uh, play a really, they do play an important role. And then connecting with the community organizations that are uh, trying to tackle this are doing great work. And then also uh, CPS to build those relationships. Um, and um, yeah, it's just so important though, is the relationships and I may be getting a bit repetitive, but- No, understandable. And we're gonna yeah. jump into a different section here because uh, like we, like I'm just trying to make sure that we keep on time here, but- yeah. You were on October 18th, you're the successful candidate. You were there to represent Ward 9. But in the larger picture, you were also there to represent all of Calgary. Mm -hmm. 
the job of a counselor is not for their specific ward. They are there to address issues in their specific ward, but they have to look at the greater good of Calgary. So in your opinion, or how would you address the idea of outweighing the needs of your ward against the needs of your city? Because counselors will have to make uh, decisions in the next five years due to this pandemic, due to the recovery that is best for all of Calgary, not just their ward. So how are you going to tackle issues? And the one I talk about now is green line. The green line might not be an issue that is prevalent in people's minds in Ward 9. It's not going to be uh, brought through Ward 9, if I'm not mistaken. I think it goes around it. But how do you address saying the Calgary green line is a good idea or a bad idea at the same time as saying we need to potentially not fix the road that's in front of your house tomorrow because we need to worry about the bigger, a bigger scheme of it all? Yeah, so I'd, I'll answer it in two parts. Uh, so the first is then answering to the first question. Um, so yeah, it is my job to represent the voice of Ward 9. Um, and then I will take, you know, using my talents, my experience to assess. And if, and then actually I, I had a meeting with the community association and they, they put me in the corner and made me choose. Uh, so it was good on them. But it's number one that I will, I will share their voice and share their concerns. Um, and I'll be honest with them. And if I don't agree, I'll let them know. Uh, and then and then if it is that situation where this is for the greater good, um, then I will make sure that I share, this is what I've heard from my community, make sure that's public knowledge that that is uh, in the conversation and then take the stand that I've chosen because it does fall on my shoulders. And I know I can't be you know, everyone's favorite person all the time. It's part of the rule, uh, but I do want to have that transparency with those in Ward 9. And then uh, speaking to Green Line, um, it actually, it, it does go through Ward 9. Uh, there's, oh. uh, yeah, quite a few actually, we got, uh, there's at least three that there's one that goes to Ramsey, one on the edge of Ramsey, um, one in an industrial area, and then two in Ogden, which can make a big difference for them. Oh, the yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, um, I guess I'll speak to Green Line uh, since we're on the subject. Okay. <laughs> it, yeah. It's the it's the elephant in the room this election. So let's yeah, talk about it if you're yeah. okay with that. So um, are you in favor of the Green Line going forward? Uh, I'm assuming you read the, the business plan that the city has put forward uh, as a, the representative of their the riding that potentially will be affected by the Green Line. Do you see it as a viable option? And do you believe that the people of Ward 9 want this project to move forward? Yeah, so um, let's start by saying, yeah, I, I support public transit. Uh, I know myself, I chose Albert Park. My wife and I, we chose it because I could walk to the train and then go downtown. Uh, so I do really appreciate that walkability and that piece is incredibly important. Um, and then what I've been hearing, uh, well, public transit, especially in this time as we're talking about recovery, that these big public infrastructure projects are a great opportunity to, uh, to, increase, to provide jobs and build infrastructure that can make a difference for generations. Um, and then, so what I've heard from community is a little bit of both sides. Uh, number one, people support having that option, that walkability, uh, things like that. And then on the other side, there's people that have concerns about the cost and then concerns even about the parking. A lot of stations don't have parking added to the accessibility and the utility of it. Um, and then also the risk of uh, all the infrastructure projects coming, so prices are rising already, so concerns about uh, rising costs. So now what I would, my stance, uh, I do support the Green Line, and, uh, but my priorities, if I get the opportunity to review it, I know council is moving forward and the province uh, is making their decision. If we do uh, are placed with that responsibility to review it, my priority, number one, will be seeing that the provincial and federal dollars are invested in Calgary, because that is a great opportunity to benefit uh, Calgarians and future generations. And then, but then number two, the other really important piece is that we need to look at the long-term operational cost. Because this is something the city will hold on to for a very long time. We need to make sure that we can afford uh, the operational piece. You know, I, at this level, I don't have all those details, but then those are the two priorities that I would take, that I would uh, hold on to if I get that chance to review. Um, it is a, uh like you said, being held up and the uh, provincial government is reviewing their the business strategy that the uh, city has put forward or is going to be putting forward. Mm -hmm. Until then, we're at a standstill. Mm -hmm. Nothing's happening on the green line. Does it make sense to move forward with a new 
potential vision of what public transit looks like. More ridership on the orange, more ridership on the max. What what can we do now to fix the problems? Because uh, you, you, Ward 9 is small businesses as well, industry. People are coming to your ward. They need to get there somehow. So how do we ensure that public transit keeps up with demand? Because people are still needing to get to and from work, even though we're talking on Zoom. Some people don't have that luxury to talk on Zoom. They need to get to work. So how do we keep up with demand while waiting for this final word that the province is potentially going to come down here soon. Yeah, that's an important consideration. And um, I know that and the thing that, you know, we should all keep in mind is that there will be a time, you know, past this pandemic and all that. And, but, but the important feature is to see how things change. Um, you know, people working at home and, and downtown and all of that. Um, so looking at demand will be important, seeing that piece. Uh, what I've uh, appreciated was what they've done with the Max Purple that go down, goes down International Avenue right by uh, close to where I live. And uh, I think alternatives like that do provide us an opportunity where it's, you know, a smaller, less costly, but it can still move people. And I, I've spoken to residents that love that, op that option of either going to the bus route or to go to the train line. Um, so I think those kind of options are, uh, are something that we can look into. Uh, again, we do have to be very conscious of infrastructure projects. They are expensive, they are big, they are complicated. Uh, so we can't be jumping into things. Um, and <laughs> if we've learned anything from Green Line, right? It's, uh, <laughs> so being very intentional and seeing what we can do. And even, yeah, starting smaller while leaving that opportunity to go bigger as needed. You talked about your three priorities, and I want to get back to that because Green Line has taken up a lot of the time in the, this election, but I want to get to a lot of the other issues as well. Um, one of the priorities that you talked about was prosperous communities, mm -hmm. um, making sure that residents and also businesses thrive post pandemic. Mm -hmm. What do you see the role of City Hall is in doing that? How do you see communities? prospering whether it be small businesses who are who've been hit hard because of lockdowns and closures and residents with their mental health issues of lockdowns and closures how do you see city hall helping people in that those respects yeah as we talk about prosperous communities uh, it's in that context of local businesses and also residents too i think maybe we'll start a little broader that um is being again doing what we can i think I appreciate, you know, how the those in the healthcare profession, the emergency management staff at City Hall, they've done a great job communicating and providing information we need. I think we need that communication to continue and to provide structure to returning. I think that's incredibly important. And especially that we're coming to the tail end of it now. You know, fortunately, we have uh, the vaccine and, and we know more about everything that's been going on. Uh, so it's incredibly important that we communicate well as we come out of this uh, and, you know, take the lessons we have from the last year to communicate well, provide structure, because that's what people need. And that's been one of the hardest things that I talked to some uh, local business owners is that, you know, they told me start up again, you got these supports and then we get to shut down again. And it's the roller coaster can't is not sustainable. Um, so uh, that's. Because the one thing that I see is businesses like you said the roller coaster is there and businesses mm -hmm. are struggling because re, uh red tape will come out and say okay you need this 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 to open up and then p uh, businesses will go out and buy and then month later okay we have to close down again because the numbers are spiking and particularly in ward 9 ward 10 and ward 5 they are the hardest hit areas of covid uh, I, uh, I, I, I'm not lying when I say that because you see the numbers, you, you can look at the numbers that are coming out from the province and those are the hardest hit areas. Um, so how, yes, okay, re, uh, communications is great, but is there policy ideas, and you're the policy guy here, <laughs> is there policies that the city hall needs to adapt or have put in place that needs to be tweaked a bit? to help those small businesses because the federal government's helping, the provincial government's helping. But when you talk to business owners and I've talked, I'm a small business owner myself, the city isn't there to help because there's so much miscommunication and not, not really understanding how they're helping. So how do we do that? Yeah, I think um, 
Yeah, it's funny. I was not going to share, I, I wouldn't call it a half-baked idea, but kind of the start of an idea is that really the opportunity, and I've seen this even, um, I guess I'll use the tenure plan and homelessness as an example. And there's different campaigns around that where we were, there's a specific goal, a specific target, bringing partners in, bringing investment in. So I think, and this is something that I'd like to explore more, uh, is specifically uh, connecting with, because we have great uh, corporate, uh, great corporations and, and community partners that invest in Calgary. So getting these big, bigger organizations and then, you know, uh, doing what we can to create a campaign where we can pool funds and then have uh, and a program with, with goals and things like that so that we can bring private sector in, we can bring uh, nonprofits, community partners in, and even um, and Calgarians, because I know one of the things that's come out of this pandemic is that a lot of people have saved money. You know, it, we see the K-shaped recovery. Some people have saved quite a bit. So what I would love to see is that if we can um, create a campaign and uh, pool funding to invest in certain aspects of uh, the community and then specifically to help local businesses and things like that. So this is not a full flushed out idea. So that's something that I'd be really passionate about. And I'd like to, myself and my team are going to keep an eye on and try to build up what we not, I mean, explore what we can to just uh, demonstrate and bring pieces of what that could be. And because ultimately the, the thing that gets me really excited is when people see that they can make a change in their neighborhood, right? They can make a change in their community. Yeah. And you have a great opportunity for those who've been able to save and uh, to affect change and really, and they, will they can be one of the, the key levers that take us out of this because we uh i have no doubt calgary we're going to recover we have incredibly talented people compassionate hard working so we will get out of this but we can actually do something that meaningfully increases the time or decreases the timeline and then people can be a part of it so that's you know what i'd like to see happen still working on what it looks like <laughs> Which, uh, and I apologize for putting you on the spot there, but we were talking about it and I thought I would ask the question, but you talk about the next set of questions I want to talk about. Yeah. Your first term on council, mm -hmm. what would be a successful first year on council for you? First term on council, what ideas do you, because every candidate that I speak to has a list of four or five items that no matter what they want to get done. So in a, in a perfect world with, COVID gone tomorrow, hypothetically, it's not, but let's say COVID's gone tomorrow. In your first term, what are the priorities for you to get done on council and to help move Ward 9 and the city forward? Okay, so this is first term or first year? First term, let's go first term. Let's let's say the, I know I, I, I mixed them up there, I apologize, but let's say oh, okay. first term. Yeah, I'll give yeah, you four years. Do, yeah, don't worry, it's too small. Okay, four years, what we wanna do. What I wanna see is that uh, number one uh, for the city hall, that as we look at the budget and the financial piece, that we have a plan to balance and to get to a sustainable place. Um, I, I've heard from residents, some people are actually afraid that you know when we get out of this, that taxes are gonna increase to try to balance the books immediately. And that's something that people can't afford. So I appreciate that. So it's not to do everything we can to balance immediately, but have a plan, you know, ideally over four years or whatever is appropriate to get us to that sustainable place. And then um, I guess my next point would then be to, uh, to partner with, uh, I guess related specifically to those two priorities of uh, prosperous, prosperous communities and safe communities. So do what we can in the context of safe communities to partner with CPS and, and community organizations and members of the community to form partnerships to uh, affect change, uh, specifically speaking to my background around homeless serving agencies to improve access to services. And then also in, um, in sentencing to see then, so from both sides of the coin. So people helping them uh, get into programs to help with recovery and to work through any other challenges they're facing. But then even in the circumstances where they get sentenced and the justice system is involved to then still get them connected into appropriate programs. So we take people out of that cycle of, uh, of low level offenses due to other issues. And then uh, as we talk about prosperous communities is then uh, to work with local businesses to help invest where it's strategic, where it's intentional, where it's impactful, but then not to overextend ourselves because we know you know, these local business owners, the business and private sector can do it a lot. It's just to help where we can, but not to get over involved and to limit them in any way. Uh, so on um, long term is to help now, 
make room for them to prosper. And, uh, and then overall relating to the bringing communities together is to do my part to be a politician that uh, builds bridges. And so it's, so it's an example where we can, where I can serve without um, putting others down and also having a meaningful way to connect with community and to, uh, to have the processes there so that people are engaged and feel like they're a part of, uh, or know they're a part of the decision-making process. Okay, there's two areas that I want to touch on because you just mentioned them. And I, I love this type of conversation because I, I try to take notes, but I don't come up with questions beforehand. I have topics, but I want to listen to you because if my listeners don't know you, I want them to learn just like I'm learning from you. Mm -hmm. um, you, you talk about the budget. Okay. The budget is a multi-million dollar boondoggle let's call it that as someone who has worked in ad, as the municipal administration i know that the line items in there can be daunting to the reg the regular citizen the not the policy wonks not the uh the administrative uh people in city hall not to the councillors. how do you address the rising inflation rate that is constantly going up with the the fact that our economy is not in the best situation right in here mm -hmm. and still needing to increase services because the city is always growing so how as a new future counselor will you say okay i don't want to zero percent increase every year because it's not a financially objectable uh, policy because things will always need to grow and if you don't they're going to get cut how do you say to the residents who are having issues with their taxes, say, yes, it's gonna be going up 1%, 2%, whatever it is, but the, the quality of service is still going to be there or potentially be better. So how do you tell residents and how do you explain to residents that yes, your taxes are gonna go up, but your services are going to be better or the same as you need them because of inflation? Yeah, so on the side, as I was talking about trying to get or planning to get the balance. So I think on the uh, communicating about taxes is doing what we can to uh, limit the burden now and then return to a normal rate of growth later. And okay. I 100% I, I believe Calgarians, they understand the process. They understand that, you know, we can't, we do need to keep up with inflation. So understanding current circumstances and the needs now and then having a plan for the future. So that's on the revenue side. The spending side is then appreciating the challenging time we're in, just taking a careful look uh, through to see what's essential and what's not essential. And that's easy to say right now. I'm not looking at the numbers and not looking at the line items, but that is something that we do need to do. And we need to seriously consider where we can um, avoid or limit spending, even if it's just limit it now, because we need to appreciate the circumstances we're in. And then the final point, uh, the, the truth is working with the province and the federal government so doing what we can to connect with them where there's opportunity. I mean, this is a whole can of worms if we get into the alternative revenue sources from municipalities, this we'll, we'll see if it's an appropriate time, we can have that conversation. But, uh, but if not, we're still talking about recovery from a pandemic. So those are the conversations we need to continue to have. And, and that's the unique role of municipal government is that we are there day in and day out. We are the closest to the people. Uh, so we need to build relationships, communicate, uh, with those levels of government to let them know when you know it's still we're still not quite out of this we need uh, your investment uh, in you know strategic specific areas uh, I'm going to ask you one question here and it's sort of off the cuff but I'm going to ask it anyway um, you are up against a sitting incumbent counselor mm -hmm. um, do you believe that and I, 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 I might cut this question because it's going to be a weird question and I apologize right now. Um, do you believe that he has best served the people of Ward 9 when it comes to budgetary issues? Yeah, if you don't well, want to answer, if you don't want to answer, I can cut this question out because it, it's one of those I want to ask the question, but I don't know how to ask it. So I apologize if you don't if you don't want to answer it, don't don't worry, and I can just move on to my next set of questions. Uh, it's okay. Yeah, I'll answer it, and you know, okay. uh, we'll go from there. Um, yeah, my intention is not to say anything uh, bad about the current counselor and to criticize him. Looking back historically, let's look to the future. Uh, I think in terms of 
uh, his vision, as we talk about spending in that piece, I think he presented uh, a perspective. He has a vision uh, and he's, he's done that. He's been around uh, for, since 2010. So he's served us. I appreciate his service and what he's done for a city. I think um, it's time for a new approach and the benefits that we've seen from that specific vision have been reaped. And, and that's a piece of why I'm running. Okay, good, good, good answer there. <laughs> it's like you're a good candidate or something. Um, last set of questions here. Um, I, I, this is my last question, then we'll do the wrap up here. Uh, I'm gonna give you about minute, two minutes, however long you wanna take. Why should you be the next city councilor for Ward 9? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I'm running to be the next city council for Ward 9 with the purpose of serving communities first. So it's not to serve my own vision, it's to get us back to the basics of listening to communities and then finding solutions together. And to do so, I intend to bring my time, my talents in terms around facilitation to that's really the approach that I'll bring so that we can focus in on um, hearing from communities and then bringing uh, key stakeholders, experts, and evidence to the table and then finding solutions together. So that's kind of the approach that I want to take. That's the, um, the method in terms of that facilitation to really be responsive to the needs of the community, because I believe that's the way that I can affect change for the time that I'll uh, ideally be in office. And then uh, getting more into practice, I think the, the structure of applying that is really um, is applying timelines and clear lines of communication to the to engagement and, and I guess not to get too deep into my policy mind of things, but there is you know the policy wheel where we identify an issue consultation, we talk about our options consultation, talk talk about implementation of one solution consultation, and then evaluate consultation. And if that loop, if there's still an issue, then we start again. So that's in a very uh, high level. That's kind of my thought process. And then in each of those consultation pieces, providing clear direction. This is where we're at. This is the information that we have. These are the bounds of what we want you to weigh in on. Please let us know what you think and then provide timelines because decisions do need to be get made. So that's kind of the approach that I'll take and uh, with the intention of serving my community and making the difference that I can for the time that I'm in politics. Awesome. Um, as this is going to be airing the second week of August, as uh, we're going to be going to a five day a week show, uh, I will send all the information to your people once we're done. But how can people get involved in your campaign? How can people reach out? How can people ask you questions? Because we've scratched the surface, I'm assuming, and we are still a few months away from this uh, election. So how can people reach out and get involved in your campaign? Yeah, so that's exactly it. We're talking about serving communities. We need to actually hear from you. So what we're doing is regular door knocking, and that's a piece of the work. But uh, you can also reach me on my website, so damoncan.ca. And then uh, you can reach me specifically at our email address, info at damoncan.ca. And then uh, we'll also be planning virtual town hall events, you know, all things considered. That's the best we can do for now. Uh, so we want to have regular virtual town halls so you can join in and we'll likely talk about specific topics so that we get that other opportunity to hear from members of the community. And then specifically uh, getting involved on the team, we'd love to have you. Uh, we need people uh, for volunteering, helping out with the door knocking because you know we're gonna do broader and bigger door knocking as we get closer. And then uh, donations are always welcome and are always needed. So we appreciate those that wanna contribute financially. And, uh, and I think that's, and then we go from there. Awesome. Uh, for my viewers and for my listeners, uh, uh, Damon's uh, website and his email address will be in the show notes. I recommend that you get to the website if you're in Ward 9, check it out. But also if you're in all of Alberta, you can donate to any campaign. There is a limit, but there you go. Um, Damon, I, uh, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Like I said, I feel like we've only scratched the surface, but uh, I, I love talking policy and I love, I feel like if you're elected, I need to have you back on the show just to talk policy for a good two hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have a similar feeling, so. Awesome. Uh, Damon, thank you so much for doing this. All right, thank you.